Guys, I am so excited to teach you about the Chin Dynasty. Uh, this is definitely one that you're going to remember. This is one of the most interesting dynasties, um, mostly because they have this crazy, crazy, crazy ruler named Emperor Chin that is cruel, he's harsh, he's strict, forces people to build this giant wall, which you probably have heard of, the Great Wall of China, and let's get into it. So the basics, the Qin Dynasty started in around 221 BC and it ended in about 210 BC. So you might be doing the math there and thinking that's not very long and you're right. That was only about 11 years because they really classified the Qin Dynasty as just the time that Emperor Qin ruled over China because it started quickly and ended quickly. So if you look at the map here, um, I know part of it's blocked, but you can see it settled. The Qin Dynasty kind of rules right along those yellow and Yangtze rivers again. And then now you see a little addition to our map here that kind of goes on that top half of China. It looks like a little trail here, but that's because that's the Great Wall of China. That's where that would be placed to try to protect the northern border of China at the time. So now let me introduce you to one of the most insane rulers I can tell you about from history. This guy's name is Emperor Qin. Um, his actual official name was Qin Shuangdi, which he actually switched his name to be. Um, so he was originally known as Prince Zheng. That was his um, birth name. He was a royal, in part of a royal family. And he eventually changes his name, and I'm going to explain why in a second. Because in, 19, in 221 BC, he eventually takes control over all of China. So he becomes king. If you remember in the last dynasty with the Zhou dynasty, all these different states and all these different places in China were kind of arguing and fighting. So he says, forget all that. I'm going to take control over all of China. And in 221 BC, he does that. And once he does that, he does his name change to Qin Shuangdi. And that name itself actually means first emperor of China. So he kind of gives himself that title, says you're going to follow me and me only. And if you don't, there's going to be serious punishments with that. He's extremely cruel, yet he's strong. So there's some insane things that he's going to do, but at the same time, that's because he wants to be as strong as possible so that people don't disobey him. Um, he was greatly influenced by legalism, which I taught you about in the last dynasty with the Zhou dynasty. If you remember, legalism means that you should lead by force and you should have strict punishments. It was not like the other philosophies. And Emperor Qin kind of takes that legalist philosophy and just runs with it and takes full control over all of China. Throughout the way, he executed hundreds of enemies that would stand in his way. He didn't like any haters. And then he even exiled his own mother. Like, that's how crazy he was. His mother kind of was going against him or speaking maybe out against him. He was a little fearful of that. So he just exiles his mother, which basically means he sends her off to a different spot that's not going to interrupt his rule over China. Throughout his time, he ordered construction of a ton of different buildings and all these different um, structures. He kind of reminds me of Ramses II from Egypt, where he just forces people to build all these different things to make him even more powerful. And with this ruling in mind, he tried to unify China under one rule, like I said, and these are some of the ways that he did that. The first thing he did, he had everybody follow the same laws. At the time, everybody was kind of doing their own thing. They were all kind of fighting. So he said, forget all those laws. You're going to follow what I say. And he had laws for his government officials. He had laws for people for everyday life. And with that, he had specific and strict punishments. Um, so if you did break a law, you knew exactly what was going to happen to you. You might have got fined by some of the things that you had, whether it's food or gold or weapons, or you might have had a physical punishment. He was known to behead people, execute people, force people to do certain labor and work, and even some public whipping. So there's a lot of harsh things that he was doing to try to make sure that they were following his laws. He forced everybody to have the same currency. Currency is just a fancy way for how you're paying for things, money. He made everybody use basically these metal coins made of either gold or bronze, and that was the only acceptable way to pay for anything. So before that, they might have used different items that they had, animal shells, things like that to trade. And he said, nope, at this point, you have to follow my currency, and you can only use these two acceptable coins. And then with all that, he also simplified writing. He removed actually some letters and characters that were originally in the alphabet and different things that they were using back then and just simplified it so that everybody knew exactly what he expected and what he wanted from them. One of his most impressive and most famous uh, products was the Great Wall of China. Not the entire Great Wall of China that you might recognize today, but the first part of the Great Wall of China. When he decided to force people to build this Great Wall, it was mostly to protect the northern border. He didn't want any enemies getting in, so he just wanted to build this giant wall on the north part of China so that the barbarians or the enemies couldn't get in. Um, he forced all these people to build it. Um, you're going to learn in a second how many people build, but basically anybody that could, he's forcing them to build this giant wall. 
The original wall that he's responsible for that he forced people to build was about 1,500 miles long. There's not many uh, many parts of this wall that still exist or not many uh, traces of that are still there, but you can still see some of it of the original wall today. Um, so 1,500 miles long. I ran like six miles the other day and I was exhausted and dead to the world. I can't imagine something as long as 1,500 miles long. With that being, being said and how long this would take to complete, especially in the mountains, it took about 10 years and about 300,000 men throughout the way to make this wall soldiers, peasants, citizens that he exiled, right? All these people he's going to force to build this wall. And not only are you building this wall, and which it takes a lot of physical power, they also have extremely horrible work conditions. In the summer, it was extremely hot, and the winter was extremely cold. We talked about that last week with China's geography. There's mountains, there's quicksand, there's all these different things in China that make it very difficult to work. So you know that many people are going to die along the way building this wall. You think Emperor Chen cared? No, right? So Emperor Chen doesn't really care if people die along the way as long as it keeps getting built. He actually forces people, his leaders and things, his commanders, to bury people inside the wall, just bury them right into the dirt once they died and keep going. So that's how little he cared about his people and how much he cared about his power. You can kind of see this is a good image here, kind of showing Emperor Chen and the power and control he had over all the citizens at the time. You see all the people working on the wall, all the different resources things that they were using and how much they were obeying their ruler um it was actually pretty effective it was, it was pretty extremely effective at the time because once they started building this wall if anybody was trying to come from the north to attack they might be able to get over the wall themselves but they're not going to be able to bring their animals and some of their weapons and resources so they would have to leave that behind so that proved to make them very weak so at the beginning this wall was actually pretty effective Obviously, the wall is even longer today because a lot of later dynasties added on to it. It's now about 13 to 14,000 miles long. That's insane. That's about 68 million feet long. So if you think about the size of a ruler, about 68 million of those, that's how long this wall is that um, exists today. People are definitely trying to spend a lot of time preserving the wall today. There's people that in the government and some laws and things that they've had to try to keep the wall as intact as possible. You are allowed to go to certain parts of the wall. Um, this is kind of what it would, what part of it would look like today. So this is an actual image. There's a lot of different lookout towers along the way, but you notice that this actually sweeps through the mountains. This is not on like flat land. So think about how difficult it was to build something like this. There is a rumor that you can see the Great Wall of China from space. Um, there has, at, at this point, there's been no proof that you can actually see it with your human eye from space. But if you look at radar images, you can see the outline of it pretty easily. So you see this orange line right here. That's the Great Wall of China if you're using radar. Radar is kind of what they use, if you know, like the weather channel and things that is able to kind of pop out certain colors. So that is the Great Wall of China through a radar from space. So ultimately, he's forcing people to build all these things, and he's trying to basically get rid of anybody that opposes him. So if you see here, it says ending opposition. That basically means ending the haters. I don't want he doesn't want anybody to go against him. Right. And especially he hates Confucian scholars. If you remember when I taught you about the Zhou Dynasty, if you watched that one before this, the Zhou Dynasty um, had a bunch of different philosophies. One of those philosophies was Confucianism. If you remember, Emperor Qin believes in legalism, which means strict punishment and strict laws. He definitely does not believe in Confucianism. Because if you believe in Confucianism, that means you believe in leading by example and treating everybody with respect and fairness, which is not how Emperor Qin ruled. So because of his anti-belief in Confucianism, he executed many Confucian scholars. Anybody that believed in Confucianism that was a leader and speaking out against him, he would try to execute. They estimate about 460-ish people he executed just because they were a scholar of Confucianism. He tried to censor everything. Um, he tried to have people bring him books that had Confucianism teachings in them and burn them. You can see that in the bottom here um, with that image down there of them actually burning the books. Um, he would have a lot of times people mark the scholars of Confucianism with a tattoo to show people that they are basically betraying Emperor Chin. And he would force them to do different types of manual labor, building the wall, other things. He even sends his own son into forced labor up on the wall because his son was kind of questioning his dad's judgment and burning the books and different things with these Confucian scholars. So he even sends his son away because he's disobeying him. So he's not afraid to stop at anything. Ultimately, he does have to die, right? So something that's kind of interesting about uh, Emperor Chen is that he was actually trying to search for a way not to die. He was afraid to die. He was trying to become immortal, which basically means he wants to live forever. 
So he was searching for magic potions. He was having people in his government search for these to try to keep him alive forever. And it didn't work out. He dies, right? So while searching for this magic potion about 600 miles away, he dies. No one knows for sure how exactly he dies. But some rumors may say that he might have been poisoned. Who knows? But he dies, right? Um, so that kind of um, ends the Qin Dynasty, which I'll explain in a second. Um, his tomb was huge, full of tons of different things. Um, they discovered it actually not too long ago, about 1974 CE. Um, they believe that about 700,000 people built his tomb and were sent to work on his tomb after he died. He's buried with objects, different food, and a whole stinking army he built. They, they People built inside of them to protect the emperor once he had died. So to kind of show you, this is called the Terracotta Army. Over 6,000 terracotta, which is kind of like a form of clay, soldiers were buried with Emperor Chen. 6,000, and they actually haven't found even two that are exa exactly alike. So people were spending their lives building these different things to just put into his tomb to protect this emperor who had so much power and control over everybody in China. So without Emperor Chen, the dynasty is kind of over, right? So, so many people tried to rebel against him. Right after he dies, people are trying to take over. Everybody's kind of arguing. No one really liked how Qin was operating things. And so once he dies, that Qin dynasty dies. And eventually, the Han dynasty is going to start next. So the leader of the Han dynasty starts to get power. If you notice this yellow right here, he expands even bigger than the Qin dynasty. And that is what we are going to learn about next week.